Well, good morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this time together, this time of corporate worship, as we gather together as the local body of believers to worship you. I pray that we would worship you in spirit and in truth, as the Lord Jesus talked about. And I pray, Lord, that you would allow us to just set aside all of uh, the distractions that may pull us away from the focus of looking at your word, and that you would open our hearts and our minds to its truth in a way that we've never seen. Give us, give us an aha moment this morning. Fill us with your spirit so we can accomplish your purpose as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, in the 1950s, marketing whiz Stanley Arnold was working at Young and Rubicon, where he was asked to come up with this marketing campaign for Remington Rand. The company was amongst the most conservative in America, and its chairman at the time was retired General Douglas MacArthur. Intimidated at first by a company that was so much part of America, Arnold had also found in that phrase the first inspiration for a campaign. After thinking about it, he went into the New York offices of Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Bean and placed the ultimate odd lot order. I want to purchase, he said, he told the broker, one share of every single stock listed on the New York Stock Exchange. After a vice president tried to talk him out of it, the order was finally placed, and it came to more than $42,000 for one share in each of the 1,098 companies listed on the big board at that time. Arnold now took his diversified portfolio into a meeting of Remington Rand and their board of directors where he argued passionately for a sweepstakes campaign with the top prize called a share in America. The conservative old gentlemen shifted around in their seats and discussed the idea for a while and then they said, but Mr. Arnold, we are not in the securities business, said another. We're in the shaver business. I agree that you're not in the securities business, said Arnold, but I think also you ought to realize that you are not in the shaver business either. You're in the people business. You're in the people business. The company bought the idea. Marketing 101, guys. When targeting a market area, you must understand the profile of your customer, yes, but you also must know what business you're in. Friends, as Christians, as believers, we are in the people business. It's not a club. We don't come together and, and, and slap backs here and, 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 and be buddies and so forth and then walk out and, and do nothing different. We're in the people business and we're to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. We need to understand that we are no different than Jesus and we too have a ministry and a mission to fulfill. We're in the people business. And so our goal today is to realize that Jesus had a plan. He had a, had a, he had a marketing plan for his, for his business, for his mission, and for his ministry. The thing is that Jesus, his mission, and his ministry were the same. Because you see, there was no church. The Holy Spirit was, was in Jesus, God the Son, and there was no church. And so all he had was the mission and the ministry of evangelism. To better understand what I'm talking about, if you will turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew as we continue our study in the Gospel of Matthew. We're in chapter 4 today, and I'm going to read beginning in verse 12 of chapter 4 in the Gospel of Matthew. Now when he, Jesus, heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. May God add his blessing. 
to the reading of his word, just to give us some context on what we're looking at today. Of course, Matthew writes his gospel, directing it at Israel. His purpose in writing his gospel is to demonstrate to Israel that Jesus Christ is, in fact, their promised Messiah. And so he regularly goes back to the Old Testament and references prophecies pointing to Jesus Christ. And then he brings it forward and shows his audience that Jesus is fulfilling all of these prophecies. From time to time, I mentioned that if we were to go back and count the number of prophecies about Messiah in the Old Testament, they would exceed 800. And Jesus fulfills all of those. Matthew points to regularly these prophecies. We see another one of those again in our text today. And so we see Matthew bumps back and forth between showing Jesus activities of healing and casting out demons. And then he brings us into major blocks of his teaching. And we're going to take those and we're going to break them apart and examine them from week to week. In a couple of weeks here, we're going to move off of Matthew for a period of about five weeks. And what I want to do is I want us to look at the Holy Week. I want us to look at a couple of days throughout the Holy Week as we lead up to Resurrection Sunday. So we're going to take a break from Matthew in a couple of weeks. But as we look at Matthew, we see that, of course, he repeatedly shows us, based on the Old Testament, that Jesus is the promised Messiah, And, of course, he closes with this great commission in chapter 28 to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, who? The disciples, to observe all that Jesus has commanded and reminding everyone, you and I even, as disciples of Jesus, that he is with us even to the end of the age. Let's go back here now and look at our verses The first verse uh, we looked at today, verse 12, it says, Now when he, Jesus, heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. Now Matthew doesn't spend a lot of time on this event with John the Baptist other than looking at him preparing the way. Uh, But I want to go ahead and and bump over to the Gospel of Luke just to, to give us a little bit more insight into what's occurred there in that period of time. And here... Uh, What we see is that John the Baptist is in prison, and he's in prison for a couple of reasons, not limited to that he criticized Herod for his marriage uh, to, to his brother's wife. And so here John the Baptist is in prison, and he sends his disciples over here in Luke Chapter 7, uh, verse 18, you can go there if you want. And it says, The disciples of John reported all these things to him, and John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, Jesus, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Verse 21, in that hour, he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits and on many who were blind and bestowed sight. And he answered them, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor of good news preached to them and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. I'm going to pause there for a second and remind us of something about Jesus Christ and his ministry and his mission because what we're seeing today friends is the the beginning of Jesus ministry and mission and a lot of times when we read these texts about Jesus healing and so forth and of course he is God he's the God man he's all powerful and he has the ability to do all of these miraculous things and we get the idea sometimes that Jesus was just kind of bopping around and he would just bump into some folks who had a need and he would feel so compassionate and, and so, and so in, 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 empowered to do something for these people that he had compassion on that he would just heal them. And yes, the Lord is compassionate. His God is a compassionate God and he loves us deeply with a love that, that is deeper than any love that you and I could ever offer. Yes, that's true. But remember this, friends, that what Jesus is talking about here to go back and tell John the Baptist is, this is what I have been called to do as the God-man, as the Son of Man, as he refers to himself. This is what I'm called to do to prove who I am. And so John the Baptist says, hey, are you, are you the guy? Are you, are you the Messiah? And Jesus goes and he heals a bunch of people and does all of this stuff. And he says, now, you've witnessed this, John's messengers. Now go back and tell him what you saw. In fact, yes, I am who you, who you expect me to be. Yes, I am Messiah. 
Verse 24. Now, when John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. Listen to what he says about John the Baptist. What did you see? What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? See, that's figurative language. Is he just this, this cowering individual that, that's out there in, in the wilderness just hoping that something's going to happen, he says? Verse 25. What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? No, we, we read that he was dressed in, in camel hair. It was very rough. Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in the king's court. What then did you go out to see? A prophet. Who is it? He's the one to prepare the way for the Lord. This is John the Baptist's role. Yes, I tell you, more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Speaking of Messiah, this is again an Old Testament prophecy that Jesus is quoting. Verse 28, I tell you, listen to what he says, I tell you among those born of women, none is greater than John. You know, oftentimes when we read this, you'll, you'll go back and you might be able to uh, listen to what, what some, some critics, some, uh, some theologians say about this, and they, they make these commentaries about, about John. And why did Jesus say that? Well, why did he say it? I'm glad you asked. He said that, friends, because John the Baptist is the one that points and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He gets to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. But listen to what Jesus says next. Listen to what he says. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than than he. Now, why would he say that? Why would he say the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist? Because, friends, John the Baptist got to point the way ahead, but you and I, even the least of us in the kingdom of God, get to point back and say, look what Jesus did. He is the God-man. He is Messiah, and salvation is by faith in him. You and I, friends, have the the awesome task, the awesome opportunity, the thing that we get to do is to point the way to Jesus Christ and all the salvific actions that he has done on earth and on the cross. What a blessing to be called, even the least of us, to be greater than John the Baptist who got to point the way. And so the text goes on. When the people all heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared... God just having been baptized with the baptism of John, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized in them. To what then shall I compare people of this generation, and what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not weep. The reason I read that text, friends, is because it brings clarity to the text that we're, that we're about to look at. Next, let's keep going here, back to our text that we're looking at today in the Gospel of Matthew. And so Jesus, verse 13, chapter 4, verse 13. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So that, was spoken, that, that which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. And I'm going to pause right there for a second. That's a quote out of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, that's speaking of where Messiah is going to carry his, his ministry and his mission. And I have a map, so if we could, if we could get my map up here, that would be great. If I could get my map. If I could get my map, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Great. Okay, so this, uh, this triangle here is actually the area. If you see up top there, it begins at Nazareth. That's where Jesus began. And that, that triangle area is the area that Jesus traveled in his mission and his, and his ministry. And so that way to the sea is a trade route. It's actually a trade route all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. So if you imagine, friends, 
that by, by missioning and ministering in this area, Jesus was able, when you think about trade routes, if you've studied history, trade routes are where most of, of the populace would go in order to trade their wares. It was a, an agrarian society, yes, and so it was a, a great amount of trade that went on, and so pretty much anyone from the known world would pass through there, and this would be a way for Jesus not just to reach the people in this area, that we're looking at here in this in this triangle, this mission triangle, but also to reach other people, even the Gentiles, who Jesus says, um, I've come to reach all, to seek and save that which is lost. And so you see here this, this ministry area that's being spoken of, and that text that tells us the way of the sea is what he's referring to, that trade route. But what we see next here, if you look there at the next verse, Verse 16, where it says, The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. So it refers there to Israel. Israel are, fo are referred to as the people that are living in darkness. They've been waiting for 400 years. They haven't heard anything from any prophets for, for 400 years and now, all of a sudden, Messiah shows up, and here he is, giving them the message of salvation, but bringing them a Messiah that they did not expect. You know, if you go back and you read texts about Messiah, uh, you know, particularly where it says the, the virgin will give birth to a son, and he will reign on the throne of David forever. Of course, when you read that text, that's speaking of the first coming of Christ as well as the second coming of Christ. But if you were to read that prior to the first coming of Christ, you would expect a conquering king. Israel expected a conquering king because that's the way the phraseology of the prophecies are written. That's, that's what they're expecting. So they're living in darkness. They don't have the truth of salvation by faith in Christ alone. And now they've seen this great light. And what a blessing it was for them to see Jesus Christ, the Messiah, coming and doing as he shared with John the Baptist's messengers exactly what he was called to do to demonstrate that he is the Messiah, the promised one. Verse 17, so the text tells us, from that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we might have remembered hearing this from John the Baptist as well. They, as well. they both bring the same message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we talked about that, that definition of repent. You know, if I'm heading in one direction and I turn and completely head the exact opposite direction, that is the definition of repent. And perhaps you remember as we, we studied our, our, our passages in 1 John where we talked about that, where as you and I become indwelled with the Spirit, as we become regenerated beings, our hearts are changed from a heart of stone, a heart of unbelief, to a heart of flesh. And you and I turn away from the direction that we are heading as sinful people, and our heart's desire is forevermore to be pleasing in the sight of God. Do we fall and fail? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. But our heart's desire is to do well. Our heart's desire is to be pleasing in the sight of God. And so as we see that text, repent, why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we talked about this when I, when I read it before with John the Baptist. When you say something is at hand, that's just figurative for being, it's right, it's right at you. It's right at you. Well, then we have this, this long discussion about, well, if the kingdom of God's already here, then is there a second coming? Of course, the text is very clear that, that Jesus will physically return. We read that in, in chapter 14 of Zechariah, that when his foot hits the Mount of Olives, it'll split in two. He returns with his saints and angels. That's you and I. And he will return a second time physically, and he will reign here on earth in a thousand-year millennium with his saints and angels. There is a physical return of, of Jesus Christ. So what can it mean that the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Well, it's, it's an already and not yet scenario because, you see, Jesus Christ has come the first time to bring the message of salvation to you and I. That Jesus Christ, his actions here on earth, the healings, the teachings, and so forth, all of those salvific actions here on earth, as well as his actions on the cross, the shedding of blood, the perfect sacrifice, are all that is necessary for you and I to spend eternity with God Almighty in his kingdom. 
Praise God for what he did. So the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You all have the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And yet it's not yet because he hasn't come fully into his kingdom to reign on the throne of David forever. And so there we have our text today where Jesus begins his actual mission and his actual ministry. And I say those two things because for you and I, we are called to a ministry and we're also called to a mission. Jesus' ministry and his mission were the same. It is to spread the truth of the gospel, that salvation is by faith in him and him alone. But for you and I, as believers, we have a ministry. There are things that you and I, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord God, has gifted you and I with and impassioned us with. And that's our ministry. That's how we serve each other. That's how we serve one another, because we are to love one another as Jesus loved us. And so whatever we're gifted in, whatever we're impassioned with, that's our ministry. That's where we serve in the body of Christ. But we also have a mission, friends. Every one of us is called to a mission. Now, praise God for those who are gifted with the gift of evangelism, that is, the gifting of spreading the gospel. And you know the type. You know that every, every word that comes out of their mouth is telling people about salvation by faith in Christ alone. And they just go right after people. And it's, a, and it's an amazing thing to see folks with the gift of evangelism go after people that are, that are lost and tell them about Jesus Christ. But that doesn't excuse the rest of us. We're all called, as I mentioned, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, we see Jesus telling his disciples to go make disciples of all nations. And there's no different of a calling for you and I today. We have that ministry, but we also have that mission that we're called to. So uh, just to review, Jesus begins his earthly ministry in the outer lying areas of Israel. What's our takeaway? What's our takeaway today? So as we look at Jesus and where he went and what he did and his demonstration of who he is, what do we walk away with today? Well, I want to share this story. An elderly widow, restricted in her activities, was eager to serve Christ. After praying about this, she realized that she could bring a blessing to others by playing the piano. The next day, she placed this small ad in the Oakland Tribune. Pianist will play hymns by phone daily for those who are sick and despondent. The service is free. The notice included the number to dial. When people called, she would ask, what hymn would you like to hear? Within a few months, her playing had brought cheer to several hundred people. Many of them freely poured out their hearts to her, and she was able to help and encourage them. Why do I share this story? Because, you know, it's very easy for us to look at circumstances and say, well, I'm, I'm limited. I'm limited by this, or, uh, you know, the, the, the people group that, that I, that I want to reach, I'm, I'm limited in that. Well, you know, it's just... The limitations, friends, are, are just paradigms that you and I have. Because you see, this, this widow found a way to reach people who weren't able to get out of their homes. They were, they were shut-ins. But she was able to reach them, and she didn't have to get in her car and drive at night. She didn't have to walk many, many blocks to, to their homes. She just did it over the phone. Find creative ways to reach people. Find creative ways to be blessed to be a blessing. And perhaps, friends, you know, in, in those opportunities, you will be blessed as well. You will be blessed. And so here's my challenge today, friends. During our daily quiet time, I want us to begin by seeking God's face. You know, oftentimes as we pray, we say, you know, we find it very difficult to pray. You know, and, and oftentimes, particularly, you know, in, in public, we find it a struggle to pray. Why is that? Well, let me challenge us to begin by allowing God to begin the conversation. Pray the word, and there will be an outpouring of prayer that comes from you that, that, you, never, that you never saw before. Oftentimes we think about, and, and maybe it's even, even driven sometimes by guilt that you just really don't feel worthy to ask him for anything. Well, let's think about this. Prayer is a dialogue. It, it's not a monologue. We oftentimes treat it like a monologue. We know God's all-powerful. We know he's able to do anything. We know we are needy. And so we go to him, and we come to him with these, this list of, of requests, of things that we want from him. Well, suppose that, that there was someone in your life that came to you, and every time they saw you, all they did was ask you for things. 
What kind of relationship is that? That's a parasitic relationship, right? And after, after a while, you'd be like, every time you'd see him, you'd be like, you know, well, here comes so-and-so. I wonder what they're going to ask for now. I wonder what, what they're going to ask for next time. That's not a relationship. A relationship is giving and taking, yes, but it's, it's a talking and listening. It's a dialogue. It's a development, it's getting to know each other. Of course, God knows you better than you know yourself. But spend time in the Word and let Him begin the conversation. Let Him begin to speak into your life and pray the Word of God. Go through the Word of God and look for reasons to praise Him and worship Him and glorify Him simply because He is worthy to be sought. Spend that time in your daily quiet time looking for that. And then as you begin to come before him, knowing that you're needy, he is worthy, yes. We are needy, yes. Knowing that you're needy, you begin to pray very much like the Lord Jesus prayed in the garden. You know, in his humanity, he says, man, I know that I'm going to get beat on with rods. I know that I'm going to get whipped and with glass and with metal shards and my flesh is going to be ripped off of my body. I know that a crown of thorns is going to be jammed on my head. I know that I'm going to be spat upon and reviled. I know that I'm going to be led through the streets carrying this big heavy crossbar. And ultimately, I'm going to have spikes nailed into my wrists and my feet. And so in his humanity, he's like, if it's possible that this cup pass, that's a need. You know, I mean, he knew what he was going to go through. And yet he says this, yet not my will, but your will be done. Abdicating to God the Father the perfect plan that was necessary, the perfect sacrifice, necessary. Let us be that kind of prayer. Let us have that kind of prayer with the Lord, with our needs. We come before the throne with our needs, yes. Abdicating though, but not our will, but his will be done. Let me challenge you to pray for illumination from the Holy Spirit to guide you on how to reach our community for the kingdom and how you can serve him in ministry. And that changes your prayer because you see, friends, if there are things that are keeping you from doing that and you pray, God, move these obstacles out of my way so that I'm freed up, whether it be a financial need or a physical need or any other kind of a need, things that would, would block you from serving the Lord, from fulfilling your ministry and your mission, pray that God would clear those off so that, with your purpose, so that you can fulfill the calling in your life. He will answer that prayer. Will you do it? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together, for your, for your perfect purposes in our lives, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would just illuminate us to your truth more and more, day by day, and that you would protect us physically, emotionally, and spiritually from the enemy and all of his attacks and his wiles, and that you would fill us with your spirit so we can accomplish your purposes. And we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, we come now to a time of invitation.